Hello and welcome to the Business Standards Morning Show. I'm Kanishka Gupta and here is a look at the stories for the day. Its future is clearly tied up with smart TVs and with the viewers, of course. Netflix chairman and co-CEO Reed Hastings had claimed last September that half of the U.S. population still don't own smart TVs. And there is a long way to go. Hastings has been saying the same about India too, where the penetration is much less. But last week, the co-founder of the world's largest streaming company went on to say that lack of success in the Indian markets was frustrating. What prompted Hastings to make such a statement and why is Netflix not able to penetrate beyond a fixed customer base here? Let's find out in this report. Shares of the world's largest streaming service Netflix plunged 22% last Friday after fourth quarter subscriber addition fell slightly short of its own target. It added 8.28 million customers in the October to December period, ending the year with nearly 222 million subscribers. In its home turf of the US, Netflix's growth has been stagnant for long now, and it has been eyeing other big markets. Netflix launched in India in January 2016, and after over six years of streaming, it is a distant third in the country. Although the streaming company doesn't reveal the number of subscribers, A research firm recently claimed that it has around 5.5 million subscribers in India. Its competitors, Amazon Prime Video and Hotstar, are way ahead with 22 million and 46 million subscribers respectively, the firm claimed. Netflix co-CEO Reed Hastings highlighted the company's struggle in the Indian market, whose 1.3 billion population offers a huge growth potential. This is what he said. What's unique about India's cable is about $3 per month per household. So radically different pricing than the rest of the world, which does impact consumer expectations. The the great news is in every single other major market, we've got the flywheel spinning. Um, The thing that frustrates us is, you know, why haven't we been as successful in India? But uh, we're definitely leading in there. Analysts say Netflix did not get its content strategy right. Going by the Audmax media data of the top 15 series on subscription-driven streaming video brands, Only one is from Netflix. Of the top 100 theatrical films based on domestic box office in Hindi since 2018, Amazon Prime Video bought 48 while Netflix picked up only 20. In Telugu, Netflix bought just 9 titles against 40 by Amazon Prime Video. Z5 bought twice that number. For some years now, analysts have been questioning Netflix's strategy about its non-Hindi programming. While content is only one aspect, Netflix had failed to hit the mark on pricing and distribution. To talk more about this, we have with us Karan Taurani of Elara Capital. So I think, you know, uh, four and a half, five million subscribers uh, is not a bad number uh, in my view. You know, they are a platform which is primarily only into content, uh, web series and movie based content. So if you compare this to peers like uh, Amazon and Disney Hotstar, uh, most of them have got cricket content, uh, they've got e-commerce bundling, they've got other services around that. So I think Netflix uh, did not have that. So I think that's one reason why the subscriber number is so low. Uh, Second thing you have to give to Netflix is, you know, their pricing. Uh, I think uh, the pricing has been a big premium, uh, you know, versus uh, competitors. Of course, now it is coming largely on par uh, as far as the basic plan is concerned. Uh, I think one more thing, uh, you know, that will happen here clearly is that the bundling aspect of it. So close to 85 to 90% of uh, India's uh, SWAT subscriptions uh, are coming from bundles. And uh, when Netflix uh, started uh, back then for the first couple of years, I mean, I don't remember if they had bundled with anyone, right? Or they had partnered with anyone in terms of Netflix subscription. But now, you know, they're available with Geo, they're available with Vodafone. They've got multiple partners uh, in the telecom and the OEM ecosystem where they bundle and probably give you, uh, you know, a free subscription with that. Currently, what Netflix was basically was more of international shows, more appealing uh, to the uh, premium audience, uh, high ARPU, uh, more appealing for the urban and the metro audience and not moving beyond that. But I think given the kind of price cards, given whatever they're doing right now, I think they'd have to probably move to the right path, uh, probably change the content strategy a bit. Uh, maybe, you know, explore the South market, which is very huge. So, so probably get more of web series, uh, originals, uh, you know, in the regional language, specifically Tamil, Telugu, and maybe Bengali as well, which are a larger 
uh, audience base, uh, so to say, in terms of regional. So I think you cannot forget that they have a very huge advantage in terms of dub content. Uh, you've seen what has happened with uh, web series like Money Heist and uh, Squid Games. I mean, definitely in the last one year, uh, they are trying to become aggressive in India. They have tweaked a lot of strategies, uh, you know, right from content to pricing to bundling. A week ago, Netflix raised its prices in the US. But in December, it slashed prices in India by up to 60% across plans as it tries to catch up with its rivals in a price-sensitive geography. It has already invested $400 million in Indian content. Hastings compared India to the Brazil market, where according to him, it was brutal in the first couple of years. A country where he thought Netflix would never break even, it is now its second biggest market with around 18 million subscribers. The competitive intensity in the Indian OTT market is also heating up. Regional streaming platforms have been giving tough competition to the big players. Yet, Netflix says the Indian market isn't that difficult to figure out and hopes it can do another Brazil here. Pandemic helped Netflix gain a foothold in India and several other countries too. The streaming giant now stares at a tough road ahead where quality content and reasonable prices will decide its fate. Pandemic created several stars like Netflix and Zomato, but overall it spelled doom for several other sectors. Micro, small and medium enterprises or MSME was one of them. Thousands of small businesses were shut and millions lost jobs. Ron and Banerjee of PwC India shares his views with business standards Krishna Veera Vanamali on what he expects from the upcoming budget for the sector and what the government can do to boost demand at the bottom of the pyramid. Hello, Mr. Ranan Banerjee. Welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. Hi. Good morning. Uh, so the first question I have is uh, that most MSMEs did not get time to stabilize after GST demonetization since pandemic came right after those two big events. So what should this budget do for the revival of MSMEs? So, Krishna, the thing is that one of the schemes that has really helped the MSMEs is the Emergency Credit Guarantee Scheme. Uh, and we believe that this particular scheme must be extended for at least six months, more months, if not for a full year. There is always an apprehension and a reluctance or a risk awareness at the level of bank credit managers. Now, there could possibly be a short term window of about three to six months that the budgets should empower the bank credit managers to have some discretion to relax the credit norms for MSMEs, given that the credit guarantee is being given by the government. And these could especially be margin requirements and other aspects like inventory and receivable requirements. There can also be an ombudsman-like helpline for, for the MSMEs to call up and get redress when bank managers are not willing to grant the credit. See, MSMEs suffer as operational creditors when companies go into the IBC. If the budget can provide for a certain fund to be set aside to make due payments as determined by the IIP under the insolvency and bankruptcy court, that if companies which have been brought into IPC in FY 2021, 21, 22, and those that may get into in FY 22, 23, for these three years, the, the MSMEs who are the operational creditors of those companies, any dues to them will be made good by the government through budget. So uh, coming to consumer spending, India's consumer spending, uh, the recovery has not been broad based. So what can this budget do to boost demand, increase, ca increase cash in the hands of people? Now, the government can provide for a quite significant hike in additional allocation for Narega to support incomes of rural households. There could also be an income support program for households at the bottom of the income pyramid. There could be a kind of a cash transfer for very selected, very bottom of the pyramid households. Now, these households have a high propensity to consume. So any money going there, that would be consumed. The other aspect would be some tax swap for at least people who are below the 10 lakh annual income limits by way of, say, an enhanced standard deduction. Now, this money, extra money in the hands of households in that income segment will be consumed. And it could give, give some push to demand for the consumer durables and the non-durables. While GST is outside the purview of the union budget and it is taken up under the GST council, the government could look at actually providing for in the budget a special GST compensation, which can be conditional 
on rationalization of some gst rates by the gst council and these rates rationalization could be in the consumption boosting and making up and it can make up for lost revenues in a way essentially those goods which are of mass consumption or those which are used as inputs in employment intensive sector for example there are food products like fruit juices dairy products butter ghee cheese sauces ketchup etc can those these be brought down from 12% to 5% products household products like hair oil toothpaste soap these can be brought down from 18 to 12 and some products like cement marble granite construction inputs they are at 28% can this be brought down to 18 because then that will give a boost to the construction sector and this can be done for a short window maybe one year see the impact it can be reversed back so this year particularly the tax revenues have been very buoyant uh, although disinvestment receipts somewhat discouraging so do you think the finance minister has enough fiscal headroom to be able to you know uh, enhance capex spending and give the demand boost to the bottom of the pyramid yeah so we have done a fiscal modeling now it reveals that the revenue receipts of the union government are likely to exceed budget estimates by almost 6.4 trillion rupees the government does not therefore have a pressure to meet the disinvestment proceed targets we estimate that the total revenue for the government after adjusting for the shortfall in the disinvestment is likely to exceed the budget estimate by approximately 5 trillion in this fiscal now perhaps the government realized this and therefore government went for the supplementary demand for grants in the last session uh, even after spending this 3 trillion the finance minister will have 2 trillion to still still to be spent now our view is that the finance minister should actually stick to the budgeted fiscal deficit level and use this excess revenue in the last quarter for activities that can clean up the balance sheet of the government and maybe infuse additional capital to the public sector banks because it will give more firepower into the next year now this if the projected revenues for the fiscal 22 as per our model are achieved we estimate that the total receipts in fy23 will be about 9.8 trillion higher than what was estimated in fy22 budget estimates the fiscal deficit for fy23 could be pegged at about 6.2% of the gdp and if the government pegs it at 6.2% and the revenues as per our model are realized and the budgeted expenditure grows as per trend this will give a net additional spending headroom of about 7.6 trillion to the government for fy23 yeah uh, we are done uh, mr banerji uh, the your answers were insightful thank you thank you so much After the budgetary expectations, let us move on to markets. Sensex and Nifty indices erased all the gains clocked this year amid soured global sentiment. The broader markets too have been knocked down as investors dump penny stocks. And if tech charts are anything to go by, another bout of selling can drag about 50% of Nifty 500 stocks below their crucial support levels. Our next report tells more. The screeching halt in equity rally has taken investors by surprise. After starting the new calendar year on a solid note, market participants are looking for cover ahead of the US Federal Reserve's policy meeting. The Federal Open Market Committee is due to meet on Tuesday and Wednesday to decide on the next steps for US monetary policy. Fears that the policy could be hawkish and potentially outline the case for interest rate rises starting in March has spooked riskier assets. Given this, benchmark indices crashed 2.6% yesterday, wiping off all the gains logged so far this year. The BSE Sensex plunged over 1500 points, while the Nifty 50 gave up the crucial 17150 level. With this, the indices have broken below their key support levels, indicating a wild ride ahead. Let's go to Business Standards Avdhut Bakkar for a tech check. In the last week, BSE Sensex gained over 2,000 points, and Nifty 50 breached the significant support of 18,000 levels, overall losing 600 points. This weakness has seen further decline on the first day of the current week. The next support for Sensex comes at 56,700, 
whereas for nifty 50 it falls at 16900 levels one can attribute this volatility for the upcoming budget session but as long as these crucial supports are held one can see a sharp recovery the pain in the broader market is more severe which is a cause of concern the mid cap and small cap indices on the bsc have cracked 8% each in a week individually spandan sphurti vodafone idea max healthcare pi industries infoedge india mindtree ttc india havels india tech mahindra emphasis and aurobindo pharma are some of the stocks from the mid and small cap segments that have lost between 10% and 28% this far in 2022. At present, 221 stocks in Nifty 500, nearly 44%, are trading below their respective 200 DMA, with Apollo Tires, Phenolex Cables, Jindal Steel and Power, Wipro, Godrej Properties, Adani Ports and Special Economic Zone witnessing intense selling pressure. And if the global sell-off continues, marquee names like Ambuja Cement, Access Bank, BPCL, Divi's Lab, HDFC Bank, HDFC, Hero Motor Corp, HUL, SBI Cards, Wipro, and Tata Steel may see aggravated selling. As uncertainty around the tightness in the policy, along with the upcoming expiry and the union budget could keep the space volatile, analysts advise investors to stay away from the mid and small caps for now and use the market fall to buy large caps. Stocks like Apollo Tires, Jindal Steel, Godrej Properties may lose another 5-10% to as they have lost the grip of 200 DMA, which traders and investors prefer to be a key indicator. In small cap, NBCC, rights and just dials may see further decline that could rise to 10%. That said, Jitendra Gohil, head of India Equity Research at Credit Suisse Wealth Management, doesn't anticipate India's valuation premium to materially derate in the near term, given marked improvement in macro fundamentals and strength in corporate balance sheet. Currently, he continues to maintain a moderate overweight position in mid-caps. As regards today, investors will eye the two-day meeting of the US Federal Reserve, bond yield and oil price movement and news flow around likely budget announcements. That apart, Q3 earnings of Sipla, Maruti Suzuki, Lodha developers and 60 other companies will also be tracked by the markets. We all know that the earnings from the stock market invite taxes. It comes under the direct tax category. Now, there are two types of taxes which the government collects, direct and indirect taxes. Our next report tells us more about them ahead of the union budget for 2022-23, which may keep modest targets for tax collections. In its annual financial statement, also called Union Budget, the central government provides details of how much money it expects to garner from various sources and how it intends to spend the funds. India earns about 80% of its total revenue through taxes. While taxation is the primary source of income for the government, it also earns a recurring income which is called non-tax revenue. This comes from dividends and profits of public sector enterprises, interests, fines, regulatory charges and user charges for publicly provided goods and services. Tax revenue comes from two categories, direct taxes and indirect taxes. Let us first understand direct taxes. As the name suggests, it is levied directly on taxpayers. Direct taxes include income tax and corporation tax. Income tax is imposed on individuals and businesses other than companies. It is paid on the income earned during a particular financial year. Corporation tax is the money paid by companies on the profits made by them in a given financial year. Direct tax also included inheritance tax and wealth tax, which were abolished in India in 1985 and 2015, respectively. On the other hand, Indirect taxes are levied by the government on goods and services and not on the income, profit or revenue of an individual. 
India introduced goods and service tax on July 1, 2017. It replaced several indirect taxes such as the excise duty, VAT, service tax, etc. It is not paid directly by a person to the government but collected by an intermediary such as manufacturer, trader or service provider and passed on to the government. The consumer bears the final economic burden of the tax. Indirect tax includes GST, Central Excise Duty and Customs. Central Excise Duty is an indirect tax levied on goods made in the country. In financial year 2021, India's direct tax collections stood at 9.45 lakh crore rupees, while the indirect tax collection was 10.71 lakh crore rupees. Direct taxes in India are overseen by the CBDT, Central Board of Direct Taxes, and indirect taxes by Central Board of Indirect Tax and Customs. Direct taxes are considered more equitable. In most developed countries, the share of direct taxes in the total taxes collection is far more than the indirect taxes. According to the latest data, the OECD average for direct tax collection in 2018 was 67.3% of the total tax collection, while for India, it was 38.3% for financial year 2019. Direct taxes are imposed on those individuals who can afford it. It is linked to the taxpayer's income level. Higher the income, the higher is the income tax liability. While high indirect taxes are considered regressive, they are paid by everyone at the same rate, irrespective of their income or financial status. A poor man pays the same amount of tax on soap as the rich man. The share of direct taxes and indirect taxes also indicate how the government has managed its public finance. In 1991, for instance, the share of direct taxes in GDP was about 2% and that of indirect taxes in GDP was over 8%. In 2007-2008, just before the global financial crisis, the shares had changed to 6% of GDP each for direct and indirect taxes. In 2021, direct taxes had a share of 4.57% of GDP, while indirect taxes share in GDP was about 5.4%. Low direct tax and low corporate tax suggest that the tax burden is shifting towards the poor. Quoting Tamil poet Tiruvalluvar, the then Indian Finance Minister P. Chitambaram had said while presenting budget for 2008-9, generous grants, compassion, righteous rule and succor to the downtrodden are the hallmarks of good governance. That's all for today. We will be back with more news and analysis on the next episode. Stay tuned and thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.